This episode is brought to you by Modal Electronics, who enable you to play and perform powerful sound with their incredible synthesizers. You can enjoy vibrant wavetable patches with the Argon 8 series, or you can produce with state-of-the-art analog-style synth textures with the Cobalt 8 series. To check out Modal Electronics' incredible array of synthesizers, go to modalelectronics.com. Modal Electronics. Dare to sound different. Ish. I mean, I didn't go beyond, you know, grades at school type thing, but I I did learn the piano from a young age and the, and the clarinet and the cello, and I did lots of theory, and my reason was to just, because then I could get out lots of academic lessons. The more music lessons I was in, the more academic lessons I got out of. Um, so my introduction was really just the piano. We were lucky enough to have a piano in the house and not much else to do living in the countryside. Um, yeah, I just gravitated towards the loudest thing in the house. Uh, we had a piano that's called a piano. It's like a player piano and it plays these roles of music. So basically like code into the piano, that into these roles that the piano plays and then the keys go down according to whatever notes are played. So it's kind of like my introduction into MIDI or something. Um, and yeah, I was just fascinated by this huge beast uh, mechanical creature and it always fascinated me. It was um, much more interesting than, I don't know, what else we might have done. Um, we weren't really, we didn't watch that much TV. Don't, don't feel we were really allowed. But also we had like a really rubbish TV, which wasn't much fun to watch. Um, so yeah, just spent a lot of time playing the piano. And in terms of like, so if you were doing the grades, learning to read and all that stuff, in your work today and since, you know, you've become Imogen Heap, who, who you know, many of us love the music of, uh, do you use like the skill of reading a lot? Because I'm always curious about that um, with, you know, professional artists um, as to how much the skill is used, like especially in like popular music. I don't use it that often, but every now and then I have to brush up. Um, the other day, somebody sent a piano um, arrangement of a song that is used in the Harry Potter play, Lily and James, and I had to check it and I was like, and I played, I had to play it and check it and it was, it sounded very nice. Um, and then we've, you know, I've done occasional bits for orchestra or had a song arranged for orchestra um, or string, uh, you know, string, string quartet or something. So occasionally I would dip, dip into it, but no, every day I don't need it. And the software that we use, we don't need to use it either because we can just move little dots and lines around on a screen um, and it's very easy. We don't need to know the notes really. What, what software do you use uh, to make your music? Um, I'm just, I just use Ableton. Ableton. I, um, when I'm more and more now, I use Ableton to be honest, and it's got some nice little vocal or some kind of comping uh, features that it didn't have before. So I, I do like it uh, more and more now, but I still use Pro Tools just because I'm used to mixing in it. I find it um, easier to kind of see everything and the way it's laid out. But creatively, I really like working with Ableton. And I mean, how difficult is it to learn to use software like that for people who kind of want to make music in their bedroom who are listening? You know, how hard is it to pick it up? Actually, I mean, I had a chat recently with um, some of the guys who developed things for GarageBand. And I think, I mean, I haven't ever used GarageBand, um, but it comes free, doesn't it, with pretty much all Macs, I think. Yeah. And they've got loads of great features now, as I've discovered. So I would recommend actually starting there. Um, it's free, it's got loads of great stuff. Um, and the kind of the basics of it are the basics of most of the workstations that people have. Um, but yeah, don't go flying into something which costs money. Just grab something like GarageBand off the shelf, assuming you have a laptop. Uh, obviously, if you don't have a, a Mac, then don't get GarageBand. Um, <laughs> I don't know if there's an equivalent for PCs there. No, and I mean, I've got to say that if you want to get a computer to make music on, I mean, it seems like you would have to just get a Mac if you can, or somehow save up and get one. I hate to uh, admit, you seem to have cornered the market somewhat. Yeah, because uh, like, I don't know, 10, 15 years ago, it was it was sort of like having a Mac, maybe 15 years ago, having a Mac was like, kind of, oh, they've got quite a swanky computer or quite a cool computer. And like, so, more people probably had Windows, but now it's sort of, 
I feel like it's a bit of an anomaly if you see someone with a Windows computer these days, but maybe that speaks of having friends with Ponzi computers. <laughs> I see, if I see somebody with a Windows or a PC or, you know, a different kind of system than Mac, I'm usually quite impressed. I'm like, oh, you must really know your stuff, you know. <laughs> you yeah, that. that's true. Because um, we're just all suckers, really, and just got drawn into the Mac world. Um, but, it, you know, in many ways, it's very limiting. Um, less open source stuff, I think, that you can use. Um, that's true. That is true. But uh, but for making music, it's definitely uh, probably simpler to, to pick up for sure. But so uh, what, what I wanted to know was, so you kind of played piano at home, picked it up um, and had this class kind of classical training doing the grades at school. But what happened between that and forming was, was the first kind of thing that you did through through? No, um, I'd released a solo record before Fru Fru. It was called a... My Megaphone, which is an anagram of my name. And I released that when I was 18. And before that, I'd released a few tracks with people. And actually, the first album that I was on, um, well, where I featured quite a lot, was Acacia's album called Hate, I think. And it was Guy Sigsworth, who was in Fru Fru with me. Um, that was his his band that he was in which I loved and I was like following them around going to all their gigs and I did loads of backing vocals for them in exchange for Guy doing a demo on my doing basically working with me on a track for my first record which we did together that was our first song that we did together as a writing production thing called Getting Scared um, and before that um, I featured on an Urban Species album called the album was called Blanket and the song that we wrote together was called Blanket and that was the only time I've ever been on Jules Holland. <laughs> oh, right. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm an idiot because I megaphone. For some reason, I had that down. I like to think that I've got kind of a good encyclopedic knowledge, but I've butchered that completely because I had that pegged in my head as that 2003. But in fact, it was about, it was four years before the Fru Fru album. So I'm getting my time scales very badly mixed up. I think I was 20 when it came out. Yeah. But um, <laughs> yeah, the thing is, loads of people, think that Fru was the first one because that's when most people discovered me was through Fru Fru. And, and in terms of, you know, making iMegaphone and starting out, what made you want to become a singer-songwriter, become a musician? Um, I just really liked making beats and messing around. You know, I had, I didn't have a studio, but I did have a tape to tape player, like a cassette recorder. Um, and I had a little keyboard and I liked making beats and layering sounds. And, you know, I did a really rubbish version of some beatbox. Um, and I just, not necessarily songs actually, no, it didn't come till I was about maybe 12 when I had maybe something to talk about. But um, before then it was just like making beats, having a mess around. Um, and then, yeah, when I was 12, I went to boarding school and I did write a few songs before then, but nothing really, more just for like school projects, like a carol or something. And I'd conduct the choir at my, my primary school um, just because I could, um, because we had a school choir. But then, yeah, when I went to boarding school, that's when I really learned about what computers, uh, what, what I could get up to with computers. They had an Atari um, hidden away in a cupboard that was nobody ever seemed to go in um but I didn't really get on with my music teacher and he often he, he realized that I really liked this computer thing um and so he would like dismiss me from class into the cupboard and then I would read the manual and you know just start tweaking away and trying to write some things in this sequencing software which I had no idea what I was doing um and it was from that that I couldn't record any audio in that and I didn't write any songs on that but I did just do some really long rambling like instrumental pieces that were trying to sound a bit like drum and bass but weren't really not drum and bass but like pre-drum and bass just kind of like you know the stuff that I'd hear on Camden mixtapes that I'd used to buy um but it sounded nothing like that because I didn't have the kit <laughs> I just had some really bad sound um sound modules that were you know the school had um and then, but I did write songs, but they were more on the piano and they were disconnected worlds. Now I had my piano where I wrote songs and my friends would kind of crowd around and I'd write songs about my boyfriends or well, I wish was my boyfriends or this person did that to me or whatever, that kind of stuff. And then when I went to the Brit school, that's when the two worlds started to collide when I, they had um, Logic uh, on their 
um, Mac Classics. And that's when I started to be able to record my voice in the studio that they had a recording studio where I learned a bit about, you know, not twiddling and um, engineering. Uh, and that's when I started to combine the two worlds together, the kind of analog and the digital. And would you say that that kind of combination between you know, analog songwriting, great analog songwriting, and then your love of, of kind of electronic music, is, is that the kind of key to, to your sound for those people who haven't listened to you before? Um, I guess so. Like, I, I'm not really good at either. Like, I'm not really good at electronic music making, but I really love electronic music. Um, but I'm not like super cool beats or anything like that. Um, I'm just kind of okay at most things and kind of get by and I think the the style is just the kind of getting by on most things with some good writing <laughs> at the back of it and loads of layered vocals um and occasionally I I do some production which I'm really proud of and I think it's quite different and unusual and I'm I'm really happy with it but most of the time I feel like I'm like the uncool kid it's <laughs> just trying to be cool um but really I I just don't do enough research about what kit is out there and I, I'm so busy with all the other projects that I end up just sounding very much like myself, um, which I guess is why people like my music. Well, it's a very good thing because uh, most people uh, just sound like other people and that's why they don't achieve, they, they don't get anywhere. Uh, one thing I was curious about is that, so around the time you made iMegaphone and you were first starting out, um, were you gigging a lot? How much was live music a, a part of your early stage as an artist? Before I signed my record, um, I've never really done any gigs. Like, I mean, I no, I didn't. I'd never done any. I mean, I'd done bits at school, and occasionally there'd be like a thing in the pub nearby that I'd go and play a song at. But I wasn't. I wasn't really. I was too young to do that. Like, well, maybe not now. Kids do it all ages. But back then, I was just you know, sixteen, seventeen. I was still in school, and I didn't really want to be a pop singer. Um, but I did like writing songs, and I did like creating music, and I did like you know, staying up until all hours, just programming beats and things. I always enjoyed that. But I didn't think that I would, I would like write albums as a career. I thought maybe I'd do something like write music for film or, you know, I always wanted to write music for film um, and just experiment. And not, I was never really bothered about, you know, the marketing and I hate marketing and advertising and all that rubbish. I, I never ever... <laughs> Um, which is part of the reason why I'm developing the Creative Passport, um, this project that we're doing. It's just all around how to just get rid of having to do marketing and advertising, <laughs> um, or at least lessen it to a lot, a lot degree, a bigger degree. What's that project called? Um, it's very much in its beta mode at the moment, but it's called the Creative Passport. And it's, a, it's an identity, digital identity for music makers to help them navigate the uh, the music industry as it is now um, by just having less stuff to do. Uh, essentially, like if you as a journalist or interviewer would like to read up about me, you don't know about it yet, but you could go to my Creative Passport public page and you'd see my most recent biography, you'd see my skill sets, you'd see the gear that I use, my inspirations, you'd see, um, uh, what else would you see? You'd see, I don't know where um you know passions that kinds of thing um you'd also see my digital other identifiers like from like my ipi number or my isni number these other identifiers that the industry uses to find us or attempt to pay us um and then all social pages and all that stuff it's basically just a trying to lasso my digital self my creative self and putting it in one place so that people can find what they need when they need it but ultimately it wants to be a point of connection or everywhere that my work shows up, so do I, so that I don't have to go in and chase people. Um, and I can easily point to the people that need to be pointed to in case people aren't credited, for example, and to have a verified without having to send my passport to this person, that person, prove who I am, that it's just, you are who you are because you have a creative passport, you're verified, therefore you can go in and change data that's incorrect. Um, it's very, <laughs> it's very, very, you know, very early stages. It's been something that I've been doing on and off for about five years. Um, wow. Uh, is, is the technology block take, blockchain tech, is, is that what this is going to be based uh, off? It's not using any blockchain components, no. It's not, it's not using any blockchain um, tech, but it will do. Um, it's just right now we have 
this is just the path we've chosen because of how we, where we can start, who we want to kind of feel comfortable to come into the space. And we also just lack, lack of funds really. At the moment, it's just a data store for musicians to put their information and to essentially put our flag into the ground um, many, 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 many hundreds of thousands of times, hopefully, to show the industry what data they're missing by not integrating with us um, in a kind of cohesive way. We are, but because they don't have any way, that nobody, there is nowhere that I can go as a musician and just kind of glide through these services. I have to log in, log in, log in, log in, and none of them speak to each other. But because I'm the musician, I'm the connective tissue, I could help everything be more than some of its parts. So by in slowly, slowly speaking about it every now and then, a couple of music makers go, oh, I'm gonna sign up for that. And then they, they go and have a look and they read up the stuff and they watch the videos. And it's not simple to follow because again, it's just lack of funding. Um, but you know, in a couple of years, hopefully we'll be up and running. Um, we've got like three or 4,000 users at the moment from like 87 countries. Oh. And they're like very kind of in the know musicians who really get what we're doing and why we need to do it. And they're helping us develop it. Um, so that's and how will it? How would it eliminate um, the need for, or lessen the need for marketing? Well, I believe that if you can contextualize your songs with useful information, such as maybe the tempo, or what feeling you're trying to evoke from the piece of music, or indeed what other people's uh, feelings it evokes through listening to your music then they could, some the song kind of become, this is getting a bit far into the future, but mm. um, imagine that the song is kind of the service and the services are like reading data and feeding back data to the song. So the song is the world of like Twitter feed about the song, a, an interview about this song, somebody's passion after running to it in a running app song, just all different types of information that kind of attaches to the song and builds its presence and builds its connections. And then at the very core of it, information that comes from the beginning, you know, from the writer, from the producer, from the performers, um, everything that you could possibly want to know about that song to help it be discovered. So say you, you know, wanted to say you were, I don't know, in a cafe in London, um, or you wanted to go on a discovery trail of music around London or whatever city you're in, you might discover that hundreds of songs have been written in one particular cafe, maybe a particular chair, or, you know, you might, it might get down to that kind of granular level in time, or you might want to discover music because of a certain type of guitar that was used or a certain type of amplifier that was used and just be like, oh, I wonder if I could get my guitar to come. Oh, I'm gonna have a listen to lots of different music. You know, so it's for musicians, but it's also for fans. You might wanna find music that's about um, getting through the early stages of parenthood, for example. Um, and you might find a song called Tiny Human, um, which is a song that I wrote about the early stages of motherhood. <laughs> How terrible it was. Um, so, it, <laughs> You know, instead of instead of saying Alexa or Echo or Siri, can you play me a song that's what can you say? You can't say that's going to make me smile, you know, or that's going to help me go running today or a song that's about the Eiffel Tower. I don't know. Just you don't have that kind of information, but you mm. should. But, but will, would that eliminate the need for marketing? Because uh, I'm imagining what would happen well, is that, that, that people would say to the company. So, that, uh, you know, oh, well, we want, uh, we, we want kind of Warner's, uh, you know, most invested in artists or universals, or we want this kind of uh, well-funded, well-connected artist. We want them to come up uh, uh, for the song that's going to make you smile or, uh, you know, for the song that people might want to go on a run to, even if, of course, the song wouldn't necessarily make everybody smile. It might make them cry or, you know, punch the wall in disgust. I mean, this is not the current remit of the creative path, but this is my kind of like dream of the future. Um, that you as a music lover, I, I imagine is very knowledgeable about music. And you might discover that a few songs of yours really lift you out of a, of a mood or really kind of get you in the creative space or whatever. And so you would um, add that data to a song or you might mention it in a tweet or you might mention it in a blog or, or in an interview. And that information could, um, could kind of be glued on to like kind of stick magically onto the song um, for further the discovery of the song. So it's actually the users really who, it's the, it's the content, the user generated content of around the contextual 
kind of use of that song um, that could bring more listeners rather than like Warner's, you know, I don't, I don't see a world, I hope, I, that's what I'm trying to avoid, a world where money buys you, um, you know, the top pages or mm. top playlists. Ultimately, you want to find good music rising to the top. Um, that's however, an amazing well, ambition. Uh, I really hope that you succeed because it does seem, I, I don't know to what extent, but it does seem like Spotify uh, and, I don't know, Apple Music, but Spotify is what I use. It does seem like, the difference between success and failure on that platform is more or less whether you're on the Spotify playlists or not. It seems to be more or less that clear cut. Well, at the moment, you know, success and failure on that platform. I mean, if you make a success on the Spotify platform, I'm not sure it's gonna... <laughs> That's a very good point, isn't it? Yeah. Um, so, in the millions, but there's no way that you can be a success on Spotify without other stuff going on you know, without making an amazing record or having tons of promotion paid for you on the radio or whatever it might be, there's just not a chance in hell. You can't independently be a success on Spotify. Um, having said that, I do remember something about um, people liking a lot of kind of, uh, you know, like background music, piano, calming piano music. And I don't know if, I think it is true. I'm not sure, I don't want to get into trouble, um, but, wasn't there something about, uh, see, this is where I should, I should check my facts and I probably shouldn't. In fact, I won't mention it, but basically um, a lot of piano music, was, it was discovered by the algorithms that that was one of the most played things, just like piano playlists of stuff. So you'd start off by maybe playing something that you know, and then it would drift off into basically like computer generated album, piano stuff, just because it's in the background and whoever made those um, you can has made a lot of money. I think I did did hear about that, and I heard about them kind of gaming the Spotify algorithm or something like that. I mean, I've, I've heard all sorts of stories about it, but it's a very good point that you make about just achieving success on Spotify is not really going to be the be all and end all for a music career. Uh, so, in, in terms of um, your own career, the album where you know I discovered your music. Uh, it's probably like quite a few people um, was speak for yourself. And I'm wondering, was that, was that album and that success of, of that album, a major turning point in, in your career? And were you expecting, did you know once you'd recorded it, that it was something very special? Um, well, I, I knew that once I'd recorded it, I was really happy with myself because <laughs> I'd Really, I'd made a record entirely on my own. Well, with the help of my boyfriend drummer um, and a few musicians, obviously. But it was the first time where, you know, ever since I was a teenager that I'd recorded anything and kind of right to up to its entire, right up to the end point, other than the mastering engineer, um, Simon Hayworth, who's still my mastering engineer. Um, yeah, it was just a, a chance to really just see what I could do, just to see what I could do, um, to see what is the most image and heap that I can be. Um, you know, I love working with Guy. It was amazing. I learned tons of stuff. If you look at iMegaphone, you look at Speak for Yourself, you know exactly where the inspirations come from, um, or where definitely a lot of um, a lot of tricks and a lot of thought has come from from working with Guy. Um, but yeah, I, I guess I definitely felt very um, super happy with it. Um, but it was also the first record that I funded myself, and that was what was key. That's because I was very happy um, that I'd spent a year making this record, funding it by myself, buying all the equipment, being in a studio from the 9th of December to the 9th of December, because that's my, they're my birthdays. And I basically bought my equipment as a, as a present to myself, having remortgaged my flat. Um, and I booked the mastering date for the 9th of December for my next birthday. And it was, it was really, really hard. Um, but extremely satisfying. <laughs> um, and, uh, you know, my fans were there with me along the way um, on my message boards. They were my only kind of, only people that listened to it. I had a manager at the time, so obviously he would listen to it and my boyfriend would listen to it. Um, and other than that, there was like a couple of people that came in the studio just out of curiosity. Um, one of them was Rupert Hine, who's recently, he died last year actually, but he was an amazing um, inspiration and, and, and kind of gave me lots of encouragement to just keep going and finishing it. Uh, by myself 
Um, so yeah, at the end of it, I was really happy that I didn't give the rights to a label that I hadn't, I wasn't doing it for a label. I don't think I could have made that record if I was signed up to a label because they would have, the first thing they would have done would have been like, okay, uh, hide and seek. I think, I think you need to put a bass line on that or some drums or something. That would have been the first reaction. <laughs> which is most people's reaction when they first heard that song um in kind of camps of people that came in um really yeah 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 it seems all normal now but um back then it was like you what what is that that's not it doesn't have anything to it it's just got this weird vocal who, sound. who said that most just, of people just, just loads of kind of like friends and stuff and 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 but I people who were feedback I released it um i mean i did like really good close friends who kind of get stuff, they got yeah. it. But yeah, there were definitely people who were like, mm, yeah, I don't know, I'm not sure about that one. Mm. Um, apart from, oh, so then when I released it, I had like hundreds of people sending me in versions of the song that they thought were better because it had a bass line or it really needed this trumpet solo or whatever it might have been. Um, and like really, really like, you would have a massive hit on your hand if you just released it with this bass line or if you just did this with it. I was like, mm. um, okay. Mm, um, yeah. I mean, they can release whatever they wanted to, um, but nothing nothing ever came of them. Apart from Jason Derulo, obviously that, that did turn into something different. <laughs> uh, yes, that was uh, interesting. Apart from, and then Tiosto. Tiosto did a version, uh, like a dance remix and kind of under the radar and then eventually official, made it official. Um, but yeah, apart from those two, I mean, hundreds of versions of that song. Hundreds. Of of course, but like, I mean, it it feels like the the production of it is almost what makes it. I mean, it is what makes it in in my mind. It was it was almost like you wanted every song to. I kind of wanted every song to kind of be like that and sound like that after, and uh, which is a bit uh, a bit rude in a way because I like. I got into the album and all, all the songs are completely different. You know, it's nothing like Good Night and Go or any of the other songs on the record. But initially I was so into hide and seek that I wanted every single song to be kind of done in that sort of like a cappella style. But what is the actual story behind the production of Hide and Seek? Most people listening to this interview will have heard Hide and Seek because uh, it is a classic song. But what is the story there? Because it's quite innovative. Um, well, uh, basically, at the end of one of the days in the studio my computer blew up um i just bought all this equipment for my birthday and hide and seek was one of the earlier ones in the you know when i was doing the writing because i really wanted to do an acapella piece um anyway so i was kind of working away beavering away i was probably doing something really complicated that done lots of editing and i was really annoyed with myself because the computer just blew up and i'd lost not just that day's work but two weeks of work of course i didn't back things up and we didn't have the cloud and things like that in those days um so i just didn't back it up because you have to back it up onto like dvds and it was really boring um and anyway so i i um yeah, so it blew up and I was really annoyed. And instead of leaving the studio that night, it was probably about three in the morning or something, um, with a bad taste in my about, you know, a bad feeling about that day and coming back to it and just being like, oh, you know, I've got to sort all that out. Um, I would always, if something like that happened, I would always do something positive. So I'd, so I thought, okay, I'm gonna just, I'm just gonna quickly record something, anything, just to kind of clear the air. And I noticed this, Bit of equipment that a friend of mine had lent me um and he wanted it back so i just picked it up i plugged it in i pulled out I, like dusted off a mini disc recorder um actually i probably didn't dust it off i probably used it all the time <laughs> uh, in those days. and then i um, just plugged in my mic and i knew how to plug it together you basically put a midi lead into the um into the box and then you plug a microphone into the box and you play the keyboard and the notes that you're playing make your make your voice do those harmonies by a synthesized voice. Um, and it's really, really fun to play, but I never played it before. So I just found a setting that I liked, which was this kind of four note polyphony one, which meant that if I was playing, even if I was playing nine or 10 fingers, it would only play. So yeah, I just sat down at the piano, the first thing I played, you know, I don't think I had the word. Wrote, wrote the basics of the song very quickly in this improvised state and it felt really good. It was probably about six or seven minutes long rather than how long it is now. 
and then right at the end I lived as I worked uh, in my studio was next to a train line and then right at the end this train passed by and so at the end of home seat you can hear this kind of doesn't sound like a train but now you know it's a train you'll hear it's a train um a train harmonized um and then another day when I was recording the voice properly um because that was just like uh, you know not singing it not singing any lyrics but pretty much getting the melody down and mostly all of the the gaps in between, the breath in between, was really, really something special about it. The emotion in the breath, um, yeah. the sentiment in the emotion in the breath, kind of was something that I actually copied and pasted quite a lot of the, like the breathing, um, into the final version. Um, and then I had to go, obviously, because I couldn't record MIDI, uh, so I had to go and refigure, I had to figure out all the MIDI, because um, some of the inversions were so beautiful because of this machine doing whatever version of my chords. Um, and then I took a really long time to write the lyrics. I knew what, it, what I wanted it to be about very early, um, but it took me a long time to write the exact perfect lyrics for that song. And then, and then I just, yeah, I spent quite a lot of time kind of building air around it because it's all done inside the box other than the voice, it's just a voice and there's no kind of real stuff going on. So um, I took a long time in the delays and at the time and went to a particular house and cooked a particular meal. And the sound of the cooking of that meal um, is quietly frying in the background, which is what sounds like rain, but it's actually of our dinner. Um, and and then when I finished, right at the end, there was this uh, um, ice cream van that would kind of come around at three o'clock or whatever, because I was near a school. And so you could hear an ice cream van coming in at the end, which is quite good timing because it is, you know, kind of some of the bits are relating to childhood. So yeah, it was a, a kind of a two or three week process, maybe. I'll just say a bit. Originally was minor. That's what Richie was telling me. He's like, no, no, originally you were going to, you couldn't decide whether you wanted it major or minor. Oh no, originally it was major, sorry, because it's minor now. No, no. I can't remember which. Yeah, it's minor. Um, so originally it was major and it was a completely different feel. Um, that's probably the best. Well, I, I don't know. That's my favorite bit anyway. Uh, it's such a good bit. Uh, it's such an amazing record. How, how do you do it live? Um, must be really difficult. Well, now I do it different, but for a long time I just played it with a guitar and just plugged in the harm a, a different harmonizer because that one wouldn't stand, wouldn't, wouldn't work on a show. So I used a voice live two voice. I think it's called a voice live two. Can't remember. Um, but now I use now I do like a kind of a bit, well I haven't done it for ages because I haven't taught for ages. But the last time I went on tour. Um, I did a kind of version of the version that's in the Harry Potter play, um, Hide and Seek 2, which is inspired by, well, it was actually commissioned by Rupert Hine, who was one of those people who came, yeah, one of the only people that came to my studio, really amazing, lovely producer, writer, man. Um, and I did one, it was called Songs for Tibet. So I did that a version of that song, kind of like a drone. Um, so when I did that live, I did it with my gloves, I played the song with my gloves. I have these gloves which I make music with, which, you know, it's kind of a project that I started about 10 years ago, but it's now this whole different thing. Um, and built up all the tracks with my voice and tuned some stuff down and then brought, kind of moved the sound around the room in 360 in some of the venues because the gloves could send OSC messages to the speaker system, which was um, DMB Soundscape, it was called. Um, oh. And I was also moving the lights around as well with DMX with my gloves. Only at the Roundhouse, actually. That one was only at the Roundhouse with the lights in Camden. Um, so yeah, it was a very immersive uh, experience. And sometimes if it was a smaller venue, um, mainly in Europe, like the well, mainland, um, I would go into the crowd and you know just sing it amongst people. Um, so yeah, it's very different. I guess I just got a bit tired of singing it on the key. <laughs> um, and it's never going to be a good a version as it is on the record because it's like meticulously sung and, you know, all the details to the the delays and everything. I couldn't recreate that. Um, so it always just sounded a bit like a bad version of it. You mentioned the gloves. Um, 
and the gloves, from what I understand, are these can these be ordered by people this year, or are they due due for delivery later this year? Is it the Mimu gloves? Is that right? New music. You can buy the gloves. Um, I think that we've we've got like three hundred gloves in the world, I believe. Um, yeah, you can buy them. I don't know exactly where they are in the cycle at the moment, but it does take a couple of months to make them. We're trying to make it so that we can buy loads of stock in advance, but we need to get ahead. You know, we need to. I, we just don't have the capital right to do that right now, but hopefully we will, and then we'll just be able to have them ready and then you can just buy them and have them the next day but at the moment no we kind of have to get the orders in in order to create enough money to buy the stuff to make the things we just can't get to the other side but we will one day <laughs> and were, were yeah. these gloves your idea completely yeah um 10 years ago i was made up of kind of um just having lots of equipment and having to be hunched over my kit or have lots and lots of samplers and like buttons all around to be able to just do quite simple things like record my voice or you know go and record some drums or whatever just it just always felt like there had to be this like massive stuff on the stage to just do some quite simple things and it was heavy um as well um so i'm very lightweight now you know I just have a keyboard um my mbira some little bits of percussion um my head mic and my gloves and then, you know, lots of nice virtual instruments um, on hard drives. And then uh, that's it. And, that, and I would basically just kind of conjure sounds on the fly or, you know, dive into sounds and worlds of songs and play them sometimes on the timeline, you know, if certain things need to come in and out at certain times. Um, or other songs that kind of flood, kind of, between stuff that's on the timeline and between stuff that's improvised and then other ones which are completely free like hide and seek or um breathe in was was free um in the timeline yeah just there's all kinds of different versions of ways to do things and it's still quite clunky um because of the software that's out there you know the, the gloves are great for expressive control um that feels a bit more like freedom than control to be honest um but there's still this way to make music which is like on a timeline and there's these blocks and they come in and out certain things and you have to press buttons um but as and when you know all technology becomes more gestural or you know spoken to instead of typing on a keyboard um then the gloves will really really come to their own because it'll just be part of the everyday in fact you may not even need gloves because you'll have your ir camera and it'll just pick up stuff and keep things and... but for now um the gloves are what we need, what I need, and what three hundred people need right now. Um, are they difficult? You can also to play? work with our software, which is cool. No, it, well, it's difficult if you make it difficult, which I often do. Um, but no, it's just as however as tricky as you like. I mean, if you want to do something simple, they're often the most effective. You know, you might be doing like a million gazillion things, but if you can't really make the connection between what you're doing and what people are hearing, then it kind of negates it. You just end up being a bit like an operator um, again. But very, you know, simple things that's become part of my language on stage, which is that when I pull my, I have like, I call it secret finger. So it's basically your index fingers, like clicking, flicking a switch. So when it's flipped switch um, and then pulling my arm out to like, you know, Northeast, or sorry, yeah, Northeast, um, would be, you know, reverb 100% maximum, whatever. But if you come back to zero or back to the body, then there'd be no reverb. Or you might raise your hand up to above where, where your head is, and that might be 100% delay, depending on how much delay you want to your voice. So it's just like this kind of very free, just get used to it, you just hear it, you're not looking at things. Um, or you might, you know, play a bass line and kind of lock into different lock into different pitches according to how, what scale you might create to play within. And you could do so much stuff, basically. Glover, which is the software, that's the real magic. Glover is the brains, the kind of the where where you map everything. It's like the it's like the um, patch bay of the gestural world and your door, um, like your Ableton or whatever you use. And it's really easy to map. The only problem is that you will have too many things to want to do. And you, you will go down many, many 
the holes. Um, yeah, you I imagine. And you will have a great thing to play with on stage um, and in the studio. You know, I, I do lots of improvisation. Well, I had been doing lots of improvisations every Tuesday during the first lockdown, just because I really needed to reconnect with making music because I couldn't connect with anything else. Um, and yeah, just really enjoyed working with Glover, um, with Ableton, just taking live requests, just being in the improvising mode, not like I'm going to perform a song now, which is really actually more difficult to perform a song um, because it's very kind of fixed. Um, yeah, set. Um, it's, but we, you know, it's still many years perhaps from, from being where it could be. Um, but you know, where it connects with VR or AR, how you can sculpt images and sounds and how you might take somebody's images from this thing and put them into this picture and that creates a different sound and a, or a different gravity for a rhythm or, you know, it's just so many things that are gonna come into play. But what's really cool about Glover is it allows you to work with lots of different input devices like a leap motion or hopefully the Genki ring. I really like the Genki ring. Um, uh, you know, or your iPhone, we've got something called Gliss, so you can use your iPhone with Glover and, um, you know, manipulate sounds on your, in your Ableton. So you can just have your phone and be like, I want to do that. And, you know, off you go. Or you want to like change a filter, you just strap your phone to your hand, you know, you can do stuff like that. So it's really fun. Um, but yeah, the, the gloves at the moment are very much out of the price range of most people. But the, but the Glover software is, is, you know, it's, I think it's 109 pounds or something like that. And it's amazing. And uh, the gloves would be nothing without Glover. So, so, so that's, that's kind of um, where the magic is. But I mean, it seems like this is just the start of, of what's going to be quite exciting for, for music making. And uh, I mean, I'm sure there are, there's so much going on with tech. And I, I wanted to ask you a little bit, because you do seem incredibly forward thinking and you've shown yourself to be incredibly forward thinking in terms of tech. Uh, from what I gather, you released music using Ethereum back in 2015, right? Yeah. I don't even know whether I would have known about Bitcoin, or if I did, I would have been sort of, you know, kind of behaving a bit like Charlie Munger from Berkshire Hathaway about it, uh, just saying, what on earth is it? Uh, and, uh, and recently, um, I saw that you had released um, an NFT, so I, I, re I really wanted to, to ask you about that because uh, they seem to be kind of exploding in popularity. And do you, do you think that they're potentially an answer to that problem that everybody's talking about all the time about um, how difficult it is for artists to make a, a living? Is that their, one of their potential um, functions? Why did you decide to get involved in releasing NFT? Basically, yeah, 2015, I discovered blockchain and I was like, there's something in this technology which is gonna enable music to flourish. There's gonna be a way where we can uh, verify work, verify where it comes from, see that trail, that breadcrumb trail, right back from the studio, and that we could bring that information and all of its kind of contextual metadata into the services and you know, so that anyone wants to know anything at any one point, it would never get lost. Um, we're nowhere near that right now. <laughs> but we are at the point where you can you know, add into an NFT and it's very early stages and that, there'll be so many things that people do with them. But right now, everyone's, you know, fair enough. It's, there, there are environmental impacts of using a blockchain, especially you know, the blockchain. blockchain. Um, it's not ideal by any stretch of the mark. Um, the reason why I'm doing it specifically right now is because I'm trying to fundraise uh, for the Creative Passport. Everyone else is, you know, making NFTs for whatever reason, um, you know, whether it's just to make money or whether it's to um, explore the new technology or to create things with their fans or there's so many things you could do. Um, for me right now, it was a conversation that I had with my dear friend, Tim Exile, who is a brilliant person, um, creative thinker. He's the developer, uh, he's the kind of founder and CEO of this awesome music app, which I love and adore called Endless, which is music making, collaborative music making, a bit like 
you know, clubhouse or whatever, where you basically chat and you have different rooms, but instead of you talking, you're making music together and it, and it makes it really easy to make great music. And it's super, super awesome. Like really, really, really groundbreaking, amazing stuff. So anyway, he was saying, I bumped into him in Victoria Park, because he lives quite close to me. And he was saying about, they wanted to make mint NFT, mint riffs, as they call them, these kind of little short format musical moments. Because it's all very, it's it's all like in the flow of creativity. It's not like songs. You're not releasing songs on on on. You should check it out. Endless with three S's. Just mm. um, making music with like yourself or some fans. Like I have a, a group called the Heap called Heapsters, where my fans who are on my app who are connected to Discord, um, they go in there and they make music together. Um, and then sometimes I I dive in and join in. Um, or you know, the other night I was in a virtual world. Um, called the NFT Oasis, part of Alt Space VR. And I was giving a live concert in a virtual space, um, improvising with 20 or 30 people on Endless, um, doing versions of hide and seek off the fly, and then going into some weird, you know, just amazing stuff, like stuff you just can't imagine unless you've heard it. Um, and the, what he's doing with Endless is going to change the face of how we uh, make music together, how we think about music, how we think about what music like the process of making music, what music as an article is, you know, should it be this finished format thing? Um, or could it be this really engaging conversation that's like 24 seven all around the world? Um, anyway, so from that, we chose these six moments um, because he said he was gonna mint riffs as NFTs. And I'd had lots of people be like, imagine you've got to do an NFT. You were like the first person to do anything on the Ethereum blockchain um, in terms of like releasing music. So I was like, I know, I know, but I'm really, really busy. I'm just not going to do it right now. I'm just, you know, I've got to get on with my thing. Um, and then Tim said he was doing one. And I was like, okay, can I do one? Because I loved him. And I was like, if he's involved, then, you know, it's not just me pulling all the, doing all the leg work. Um, so that's what it is. It's six riffs, um, six short format, short format pieces of music. They're not songs. They're like moments of improvisation with other people. Some of them have lyrics, some of them don't. He's got a different story. Um, money for the Creative Passport. Um, the Creative Passport was originally funded by, I think, 180 sales of uh, Tiny Human, or it was like, I think we raised about 200 Ether, you know, back then. Oh, well, it was like 0.66 of a pound or something. That's what an Ether was. Um, and it was the first piece of art to ever be bought on the Ethereum blockchain. And what we did was we, um, you know, made all of the people who written that song or not written, but performed on that song with me, we gave them all a split and gave them all their smart contracts. They had their own smart contracts. We had a smart contract, they had their wallets. And then on the transaction of the money from somebody buying an Ether to pay for the song, then it paid all the musicians instantly. Now that's not like rocket science. Um, and that happened many years ago with mp3.com before you know, everybody got involved in the labels, got involved in digital music distribution. Um, so sometimes it can take two years to get paid, you know, from a stream to a person. Um, and that's ridiculous. So even though it's not rocket science, of course, why shouldn't you pay for something and then immediately get money? You can do that in other platforms, but not with ones that involve lots of collection societies and such. Um, they were trying to make it simpler, but sometimes it makes it hard. Um, so yeah, so the reason is I'm trying to raise money again, because basically those 200 sales or 100 or however many sales it was, I actually need to check on that. It was very few anyway, but it wasn't about the record sales. It was about the fact that we achieved this smart contract on a blockchain, first time ever, very exciting. It got a lot of press, some negative press, like, ha ha, I'm just only sold 180 copies of a new song. <laughs> and I was like, yeah, this is amazing. This is like new technology. I'm so excited, whatever. Um, but then about a year later, or maybe a couple of years later, um, those 200 Ether were worth a lot more, you know. Um, it, yeah. At that point, they were worth 200,000 pounds. And I, I wasn't even noticing. I never even thought for a moment to invest in Ether. It was really stupid. Never thought to ever invest in cryptocurrencies. It was never about the money. It was always about the underlying technology than what it could do or what potentially it could do. And if you don't get stuck in and explore, you're never going to help shape that space. So this is another example of that, you know, from that 200,000, we couldn't get it all out because of the complexities of taking money out in crypto at the time, but we got as much as we could out. 
and it funded a bit of the creative passport work, which is the thing that we're doing now. And again, we need money. I had money coming in from the Harry Potter play, which is how I've been funding the creative passport, um, not wanting to go down the typical VC route just because it can, you know, get in the way of decisions when people are thinking about profits. Um, so we've kept it, um, you know, funded by me and some various different, a couple of grants that we've got. Um, so this was a chance. I'd heard that people were making big money in NFTs and I was like, okay, well, you know, I was one of the first people to explore Ethereum blockchain with music. So maybe that might mean that my NFTs might raise a lot of money, um, but you need marketing and you need promotion. And it's something that I hate doing. Um, <laughs> and I'm not very good at. Um, so actually, we did the first, we did our NFT drop, it was only going to be 24 hours, and we, we didn't make, literally, like, I think 100 people viewed it. Um, I had, like, hundreds of tweets, hate, hate messages of Imogen, how dare you do something with a blockchain? It's so bad for the environment. I'm like, I know it is. I know, I know. Don't you think I know? Um, but we have to shift the needle. Like, this is our chance as musicians to get in there and start developing. And there are, there are cleaner blockchain solutions than the Ethereum blockchain, for sure. Um, so there is a lot of backlash around the choice that we chose to use OpenSea. And the reason we chose to use OpenSea was perhaps misguided, um, was that we thought that's where the money was. <laughs> because with the, you know, second layer um, blockchain technologies, they are they attract less of them people with the money. And my theory, uh, which has probably failed, um, was that the people that invested early on with Ethereum would have that kind of relationship with me and with the with my music because of what happened all those years ago, that they would be the ones or you know, with all the ether that would buy the track. Anyway, um, the only person, the only one that we did sell, which is quite a cool story, because um, we wanted, we had a reserve price of two ether. Um, I, I forgot to mention that basically forty five percent of it goes to the creative passport, twenty five percent goes to the musicians. So it's not always me. Um, there's other musicians like fans or other people on heaps to, uh, on the endless community uh, on the app. Um, um, we're all trying to raise money for things. There's Andy Khan, who's a designer, he gets 16%. He's raising money for Streamliner, which is a whole nother conversation. He's amazing. Um, and then there's the producer of the NFT, which is Sam Parker, and Simon Hayworth, who's the mastering engineer, he gets 3%. Um, and who else? Oh, and then the 5% go to Nori, is a carbon capture company, carbon renewable company. And again, I've had so much backlash about this. It's not the answer, but it could be part of the answer. We have a lot of extra carbon on the planet that we need to remove. Um, it's not good enough just to you know, stop using uh, these technologies and everything else that we're using. Um, we need to actually extract it. Um, and there are lots of other companies that do it, but Nori was the one that I came across in Clubhouse discussing blockchain and environment. Um, so I, Quickly, I just found his number, called him up. Within two minutes, I was having a conversation with him with the Endless uh, and Streamliner guys. And um, yeah, he was really excited. He was like, great, this is brilliant. It's gonna promote Nori. Um, it's gonna encourage other artists who do NFTs to also do the similar thing, which has already happened. Already musicians are saying, I'm following Imogen's lead and I'm you know, putting some of my money into Nori. So anyway, I'm getting a little bit heated under the collar because I've had a lot of messages on Twitter um, it's like, I can't believe you're doing this. I'm so disappointed in you. And I'm mm. like, I don't understand like the length of stuff that we've done and the reason that we're doing this. You know, it's not just a quick decision to make some quick money for myself to buy a Lamborghini, as if. Um, <laughs> this is like to fund a project that was originally funded by blockchain that could really massively change the music industry, like really massively help music makers for the better. And the only reason that I have to do that is because the system doesn't work. You know, if the system worked and musicians were, you know, making money as they should be in ways they should be, they wouldn't have to be doing NFTs. Um, but that's the reality is that that's what we're forced to do, you know, and yeah. also, we're creative and we want to try new things. You know, this is an entirely new format. It's not even a format, it's like a box to put whatever format you want in it. However you want to divide up those sales, however you want to gift things to your fans or not, whatever you want to put in the metadata, there's so much room for creativity. It could be art, it could be a play, it could be a film, it, it could be a 
we, it could be a VR, it could be so many, it's anything, it's like an experience, you're basically paying for an experienced piece of art, and you're, it, essentially, you're, you are being a, a kind of patron um, by paying for that thing, um, and in time, I think that the kind of distance between this thing that's called an NFT, which is not a very, like, a non-fungible token, it's not got a very sexy name, it, <laughs> releases there'll just be exchanges of artistic things that, that people want and people give um but at the moment yeah there is this environmental impact and it's real you know um but this technology is is going to change lives in a massively positive way um so many systems and industries that are already being you know re kind of configured and imagined with the kind of less top down more ground up grassroots and being able to support one another um, and transparency and so there's, there's so much still to develop but anyway um that's where i'm at there's like these six little pieces of music um and that, can, are they still are they still on sale now are, well, uh, some are some are still on sale basically extended the sale because it was embarrassing and it's on open sea it's on open sea yeah um and the one person that reached the two ether um was don diablo who he was the first like massive music sale. Um, like I think he reached a million pounds, or something ridiculous. Um, but he'd spent a whole year on his on his um, on his job. I think he's done three, and he spent a ridiculously long amount of time. So it's perfectly justified as well. And it's uh, I haven't actually seen it, um, but I've just read a little bit about it. But I'm very new to this, you know, myself. Even though I was very early back then. Um, but the cool thing about our worm is, like I said, we um, we're kind of exemplifying how artists could decide to share their profits. And if they are concerned about the environment, there are ways. It's not the solution, but it's part of the solution, perhaps. It, we're not gonna stop using blockchain. So you might as well, you know, do a little something while you can. Um, and also the credits and the distribution, the splits are all transparent in the metadata. If you're enjoying the greatest music of all time podcast, you can keep up to date with all of our latest episodes for free by subscribing. If you're watching on YouTube, the subscribe button is located at the top of the Tom Cridlin YouTube page. It's also at the bottom right of any video that you watch on YouTube. If you're listening on an audio platform, such as Spotify or Apple Podcasts, you can subscribe at the top of the page.